Hello, uh, I'm Richard Kennedy with James Corner Field Operations. On behalf of the field operations team, we are very excited to be at this point and to be sharing our ideas for a more resilient Bay Area. When we began this effort, we had this notion of one bay, many communities, many solutions. The idea that the bay is something that we all share as we live around its edges in various cities and communities around the bay. But the notion of many communities, many solutions suggests that any approach to addressing sea level rise and resiliency around the Bay Area needs to accommodate an enormous amount of variation, enormous amount of difference, uh, and a variety of points of view. Over the past two months, we've been touring sites around the Bay with many of you, um, visiting over 50 uh, sites uh, around the North, South, East, and West Bays. And one of the things that became very clear to us as we toured around these sites uh, is that many of them are actually disconnected from the Bay itself. There are, there are a number of barriers between communities and the waters of the bay, highways, train lines, water infrastructure. Uh, and in some ways, uh, some of the communities actually turn their backs on the marshes of the bay. They see little value in the marshes or little opportunities for connection. So we asked ourselves a number of questions. Uh, the first is how might we reconnect bay communities to the bay in more direct, visceral, and experiential ways? The second, uh, how might we think about a number of communities, not only in terms of sea level rise resiliency, but also in terms of more broader resilient systems, more infrastructures, more mobility, more connectivity, more community, more housing? What if we think of the Bay in terms of more nature, so expanding the ecological initiatives around the Bay, the, the, salt, ponds, the salt ponds to the South Marsh in the South Bay and, so, and, and salt ponds at the South Marsh Project, the living shorelines on the North Bay, expand these to do more across the Bay Area uh, and to contribute to a more resilient uh, region. Identify also more connectivity uh, opportunities, so finding those projects that can increase capacity for the whole region in the, with the most effective way. So this does mean more trans-bay tubes, more connections across the Bay, so big scale efforts like that, but also finer grain networks of hubs, connection points that link smaller communities and more remote communities to each other and to the whole region. Uh, and then lastly, more community, identifying opportunities for new investment, for densification, for uh, intensification, uh, and housing within communities uh, and cities around the Bay. So this idea of more nature, more connectivity, and more community, the kind of ingredients to create a more resilient Bay Area, all with the effort to try to connect communities more integrally uh, to the Bay itself. So we call our effort Bay Towns, reconnecting cities, uh, to the bay and revitalizing the edge. Uh, so our approach is about nature, but it's also about how uh, communities and towns around the bay relate to one another uh, and to the bay itself. And we do this through four physical typologies, what we call edges, sponges, corridors, and hubs. And they all have a particular function, uh, and they would all be differentiated by place. Edges are about protection, addressing sea level rise at the perimeter. Sponges are about absorption, uh, retention, detention, and collection of stormwater within the communities and urban districts. Corridors are about investment, about creating new opportunities for growth, for housing, intensification, uh, but also community amenities and community benefits. And hubs are about transit and connectivity, nodes within communities that link them to each other and to the whole region. So each of these moves, edges, sponges, corridors, and hubs, are differentiated and varied depending on where they are and where they're located, particular locales and settings. In choosing where to apply this idea and this methodology, uh, we decided to make an early decision to just spread ourselves around the bay, to pick a site in the north, a site in the south, a site in the east, and a site in the west. We chose the sites then based on those that are the most lowest lying and most vulnerable today. So the communities that are the most susceptible to sea level rise uh, in the near future. We started with San Rafael in the north. San Rafael is today a cool and charming place. Uh, it actually has a great marina feel. Uh, it's a charming uh, community centered around the canal district in the San Rafael Creek. Uh, there are a number of attractions on the canal itself. Uh, so water activities, water access sites, restaurants and cafes. This is an events ground on the canal. It's, it's a fantastic place. I suggest you go there. I've taken my family there. It's really, really great. It's also connected to the Smart Hub. Uh, this is a hub and node uh, for North Bay communities that connects trains to shuttles and buses for the whole region. San Rafael is also a very organized community. They dub themselves the city with a mission, and we, we believe that's true. This is a community that is ready to make things happen. But there are many issues and challenges. 580 and, eight, and 101 come together and separate neighborhoods from each other and neighborhoods from the Bay. 
Some of the roads and bridges are very low-lying. They're very close to sea level today and are already susceptible to flooding and inundation. The same is true for housing. There's housing perched on the canal district, very low-lying uh, and experiencing flooding today. And the canal itself uh, is, is, uh, uh, needs to be dredged. This is very costly uh, and there's no long-term source of funding. So those ideas seen more geographically and spatially. You have the San Rafael Central Reach here. In 2050, most of that entire uh, reach, uh, downtown and the Canal District is flooded, and that issue is only exacerbated over time. It is all on mud. This whole central reach and downtown area uh, and critical transit infrastructure of the region is passing through. So lots of vulnerabilities and issues to, to address. We begin and we start with the edge, and we look at the edge and try to find ways to revitalize this edge uh, as a more robust living uh, natural system, trying to restore some of the historic marshes uh, that once occupied this watershed. And so we do that by identifying the lowest lying and most um, underutilized sites along the eastern shoreline today, so canalway site and other, and other underutilized sites. Those become areas that the uh, future bay will be able to be let in and migrate inward. So setting up sites for, as, that are open space and parks today that become the future marshlands uh, and edge habitats. We also expand the Living Shorelines projects and all the experiments there, not only to build up subtitle habitat, but also to trap sediment that's moving in the region and help to build up mud for even more protection over the long term. So a much thicker and more ecologically robust edge. Inland, within the canal district, uh, we propose a mosaic of sponges. These are stormwater absorption gardens on the one hand, so uh, projects to collect water, re uh, retain water, detain water, uh, but also uh, they become the green infrastructure for any future community uh, in the central district. Um, the parks, the green spaces, the sport fields that are serving dual function of collecting water, reducing impacts of flooding, but are also the community amenities uh, for, for the people of San Rafael. We leverage the smart hub and make it connect to more people uh, and offer more for North Bay, tying the North Bay to the whole region. And then lastly, we revitalize the canal district. Uh, and we do this by opening up sites along the canal district and making a decision to make the canal district a central and mixed use hub uh, of San Rafael. We take material from the canal, we create higher ground for more safe and resilient uh, forms of, of housing and development. Existing housing would remain, but also be lifted up and adapted Alternatively, in those underutilized sites, we also can create green spaces uh, around the mixed uses. So parks today uh, that are uh, recreational amenities for the community, in the long term, they become areas of absorptive grounds for the tides and waters to migrate into. The result is a much greener, uh, more ecologically vital, uh, and more revitalized whole region of San Rafael, uh, all oriented and centered around uh, the, its greatest resource, the canal district and the bay. In the south, we look at an, a, a larger stretch of the South Bay, and we made a decision to look at the stretch from East Palo Alto to Sunnyvale, because for a number of reasons. Uh, firstly, the South Bay, in some ways, does have a lot of similarities. There are communities that are all in the Santa Clara Valley are very flat, um, and while they're on the bay, they're psychically disconnected, we would say, from the bay. You can be very close to the bay's shore, but because of the salt ponds and the tidal marshes, the bay waters are quite far away, so you can be miles away from the water surface. So there's a psychic disconnection uh, to some communities. On the other hand, you have communities like East Palo Alto that are right there, they're right on the frontier. These are the first, this is one of the first communities that will be susceptible to flooding uh, with sea level rise, and so it's, it's an immediate and urgent condition. So we look at that stretch from East Palo Alto all the way through Sunnyvale, uh, and look at its impacts to, to flooding, 2050 and 2100, exacerbated over time. One of the interesting challenges uh, in working in the South Bay at a large scale is that many municipalities uh, do have uh, jurisdiction over the edge uh, and over the marshes. The salt ponds themselves also have an interesting uh, ownership structure. You have the, the Fish and Wildlife owning the salt ponds restoration work, but there are a number of other ponds that are outside of that that are owned by local municipalities, local water districts, uh, they're flood basins today or part of the water treatment facility, uh, or they're just part of the overall operation of the uh, connected ponds. So we're trying to find something that's holistic, that can address a lot of the similarities here, uh, but try to resolve uh, as many uh, uh, challenges as possible. Beginning with the edge. Uh, we start with the existing levee uh, shown here today. So this is the current highest point along the edge. 
And we modify that. We find ways of, of opening that up, widening it at the intersections with the creeks to create what we call micro deltas, intersections where the creeks meet the bay, create more fluvial and inter intertidal conditions. The creeks themselves are also widened out um, and softened. This is a concept that's already in place by the San Francisco Creek Joint Powers Authority. They are developing innovative ideas about widening, softening the creek uh, within Palo Alto. We take that model and multiply it through the creeks around South Bay, soften the shores and edges, uh, create to slow down water, create opportunities for detention, retention, and ecology. But these also become the trails and parks that connect the towns of South Bay to the bay itself. We then identify the ponds that are not a part of the salt ponds restoration effort, and we begin to adapt those uh, in the near future. So today, they're open water surfaces. Uh, in the near future, these could become part of the Bay Trail and Water Trails program. They could, become, they could offer more uh, uh, excitement, more uses for more people. So swimming, uh, kayaking, boating, and even surfing happening in these ponds. In the long term, those inland ponds become the, the areas that the tidal marshes migrate into. So as waters rise, those are built up in higher elevation and providing that uh, future protection. And then lastly, we identify sites along the transit corridors of 101 uh, and, and, the, and the rail lines, and those become areas for more housing to help solve uh, issues around growth uh, and capacity uh, in the South Bay. So the result is a much more connected uh, and unified uh, series of communities in South Bay that are all more integrally connected to the water and experience of the Bay. On the east, uh, Oakland and Alameda. Oakland and Alameda are the urban core of the East Bay. Uh, and what's amazing is that there's over 170 communities in the two cities today. Uh, and they're all disconnected from one another by infrastructure. 980, 880, 580, 24, Amtrak, all separate communities from each other, communities from the Bay. So any, any um, uh, effort to address resiliency in the East Bay needs to look at the role that infrastructure plays uh, in terms of what it offers, um, but also um, the liabilities that it creates in terms of health and access uh, to resources and amenities. The diversity of communities is also something to leverage, that while we're thinking and working at a very big scale, uh, we're going to try to uh, increase and maintain that richness and diversity. The waterfront is a project that um, uh, it, it's so obvious that it should be a destination for more people uh, within, within the East Bay. It has one of the most fantastic skylines in the, in the world, looking at San Francisco and the Golden Gate, and that could be leveraged. But there are a number of challenges. Uh, 880 is in the way, and it's a, a major psychic divide between downtown and the waterfront. The same is true for 980. 980 is a big cleft between West Oakland and downtown. The seawall is also old uh, and not sizably stable. It needs to be retrofit to protect future investments uh, and communities living uh, inland of the seawall. So seen geographically, you have Oakland Alameda today. Uh, over time, the west end of, Oak, of Alameda and West Oakland are extremely susceptible to flooding. Uh, and you have critical highway infrastructure coming through the region. So our approach uh, is to look at creating greater connectivity between the two cities. And we start with uh, perhaps our, our most significant move, and this is to propose a new Trans Bay tube. Uh, this is a center point of our proposal, but it's also a center point of the state rail plan uh, for this year, connecting two of the most uh, critical urban centers of the region to one another. And we do this through the 980 corridor. We take what is a very inefficient corridor today, the sunken bowl shown here. We cap over that. We reorganize laneways uh, and add the train lines within the corridor. We cap over that to create new parklands and green spaces that connect West Oakland to downtown and also open up opportunities for air rights development uh, in the forms of new housing and new amenities. Seen today, that cleft, that divide of 980, a major psychic divide between West Oakland and downtown, capped over to create new, uh, healthier, greener spaces, greener amenities, but also the opportunity for more housing that over time is a way for Oakland uh, and Alameda to grow. We do the same thing with 880 and Amtrak. We take those infrastructures and we, and we sink them down. We take 880, put it below grade in tunnels, creating uh, continuous at-grade boulevards. This seems radical uh, and it seems a, a, like a big move, but we're doing the exact same thing in Seattle's waterfront today, taking down the viaduct along the waterfront and making a strong connection between downtown Seattle and the Sound. 
We do the same thing with Amtrak. We take that, that, that barrier and drop it down, creating continuous at-grade uh, boulevards. So what is now today an unsafe, inaccessible, uh, and disconnected waterfront is made much more accessible, much more linked, uh, much more green, uh, and much more uh, open to more people. Lastly, we look at the edge and develop a seismically, seismically resistant seawall that does more. Uh, it can be ecologically rich, it can, it can incorporate habitat uh, and marshlands, but it can also become more pedestrianized uh, and offering more experiences of the bayfront. The result is more connected, uh, Oakland and Alameda, they're connected to each other and they're connected to the whole region, but they're also greener uh, and more healthy uh, and more vibrant uh, and more accessible uh, throughout. Lastly, on the west, San Francisco Mission Creek. Mission Creek is one of the lowest lying areas of San Francisco. Uh, it, it is a historic creek, uh, and again, one of the lowest lying areas of the city. Uh, a lot of investment has happened there in the past uh, decade or more, um, but there's still more to be done. It is not yet complete and is not yet protected from sea level rise. This is an image of the existing houseboat community on Mission Creek. We show this for two reasons. Um, one, um, uh, the idea is that um, uh, we're showing big scale moves here, and any scale, any, any work that would happen in the future would have to involve stakeholders and community members like the houseboat community on Mission Creek, um, and to make sure that it's more rich and thoughtful and nuanced to their particular issues and needs. But also, I show this image because it suggests a character and a richness that any future project uh, at Mission Creek might leverage to build in something that is really specific and nuanced to the place. It's quite an eccentric and idiosyncratic thing to really leverage. At this, and, and similarly, the recreational uses of the creek are something to, to leverage as well. The idea of having a linear recreational water body at the center of San Francisco is something to maximize and leverage and make available to more people. But there are issues. 280 and Caltrain separate Mission Bay and Mission Creek from the rest of the eastern uh, uh, neighborhoods and from Soma. There's also a CSO that dumps into the creek, and there are more innovative ways of dealing with wastewater in cities, and perhaps this could become a pilot or case study to address that. There are shelves of habitat within Mission Creek, but these are vulnerable uh, and susceptible to flooding uh, and inundation. So our, our effort is to address sea level rise first uh, and find quick ways of doing that, but to also protect, project, protect infrastructure and create opportunities for more access to the waterfront for more people. The first move is to bring the tube across from the East Bay, connect uh, the tra train line into Mission Creek, into the Caltrain station, and then northward to the Trans Bay Transit Center, connecting San Francisco to the East Bay, increasing the capacity of the rail system of the region significantly. That creates an opportunity to adapt the edges of Mission Creek, to create higher ground using that material, lift up the edges, create more ecologically rich infrastructure along the creek, but also higher grounds of amenities and park spaces that the whole region uh, can enjoy. So higher performing edges, greener, richer, more ecologically vital, uh, but also uh, increasing the character of, of Mission Creek that exists today, uh, leveraging this diverse idea of living on the water. And lastly, we identify those areas for investment uh, where um, we're opening up opportunities for development and for new housing. Uh, for example, looking at the 280 corridor as well as the Caltrain corridor and just finding ways to open them up uh, and create more air rights opportunities, development opportunities to accommodate future growth of the city. For example, taking the Caltrain corridor here, the King Street Station, uh, and modifying that by compressing it, making it more efficient, capping over it to create new parklands that connect Soma to Mission Creek and the eastern neighborhoods to the waterfront, but also opening up air rights in the form of new housing. Uh, the result is a much more connected, uh, green, uh, and ecologically rich district of the city. Uh, but most importantly, uh, it's about uh, connecting San Francisco to the East Bay, connecting the two major urban cores through a piece of critical infrastructure that will benefit the whole region. So connecting towns together uh, and connecting them all more uh, vividly, more directly, and more experientially to the Bay. Thank you. Thanks so much to our presenters uh, this morning. Thanks to everyone for keeping on time. Uh, so we're going to break for lunch now. We're going to have some time for uh, eating and mingling, and then 
we're going to get together um, in about a half hour or so. We're going to, um, we've been joined by Hank Ovink, um, our juror and uh, important person in Rebuild by Design and lots of other things as well. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, we'll hear from Hank a little bit uh, to open up our afternoon session. Thank you.